everyone. My name is Dion. My name is Dion Lafacard. I'm the technical director for the Trans Tobago Football Association. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon on behalf of the Normalization Committee and the Trans Tobago Football Association. Today's seminar will be conducted by Mr. Mark Rivers of the Arsenal Football Club. And before we, we, we get this seminar started, we just have a little bit of formalities. I'm just going to ask Mrs. Knott to say a prayer on behalf of the group for what is happening in our country right now, please. Mrs. Knott. Thank you. Thank you, Dion. And for everybody participating, I'm sure, just like me, we're all worried and concerned about our country. So in, in whatever religion you're from, you would all have some, some belief, some spiritual belief. And so we ask you now to invite that presence within us and to ask, in our case, in my, as a Christian, ask God to really help the nation to abide by the rules, to cope for all those grieving families to help them through this very difficult time. And for all the people in the nation to understand that what COVID-19 has done to the nation and to adhere to the rules. We must beat this. With God's help, we will. And so we ask his presence today to inspire all of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you very much, Mrs. Nott. And I would like to recognize the presence of the mem two members of the Normalization Committee, the Chairman, Mr. Robert Haddad, and also Mr. Nicholas Gomez. Mr. Haddad, can you just say a few words, open give a few open remarks, please, on behalf of the Normalization Committee? Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you very much, Dion. Um, appreciate the invite. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome Mark. Mark, thank you for making the time. We appreciate your your your. Um, your input here, and, and we look forward to a, a very productive seminar. Dion, congratulations. I appreciate the, the initiative, and I really think you're doing a good job. Um, Nicholas, thank you very much for encouraging and supporting this, this whole venture. I really appreciate it. To all of you, thanks for joining. Thanks for um, engaging here and sharing with us. And more importantly, um, the, the motto we are trying to, to, to develop is a united front where we all come together as one. Um, I think seminars such as this could only help us get to where we need to get. We are in a very difficult situation, not only in our country with COVID, but our association is in a very difficult time. Um, we're gonna continue trying to keep it positive and to keep uniting and moving forward with all the players, it's not every minute, we, not all the time we can please everyone, but we are trying our very best. So again, Dion, thank you for this. Mark, good luck. And I wish you all the success here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Haddad. And, and, and just to echo what Mr. Haddad said, we're really trying to get everybody to unite, coaches, um, all the stakeholders. And that's a great message. That's why we call it Everybody In. So without any further ado, I would like to to bring on stage now the, the man of the moment, Coach Mark Rivers. Coach Mark, welcome. And please, the, floor, you. the floor is yours. Thank you, Dion, and uh, a very warm welcome um, from the UK. It is lovely and warm over here today. And um, we'll be on for um, probably just over an hour, an hour and a half or something, because people tell me there's a, a football match on later on that uh, some of us would like to see. So um, <laughs> I'll make sure that I'm uh, concise. But um, yeah, a very warm welcome. Um, just some, a brief sort of history of myself, really. So um, I've coached at a variety of different football clubs here in England. Um, um, Wickham Wanderers, Reading Football Club, uh, Wimbledon when they were a Premier League team. And I suppose formerly with the Football Association, the English Football Association for 10 years, where um, I did a lot on the sort of coach education side. So you'd find me delivering the uh, FA Level 1 courses, Level 2s, the, uh, the, the highest grassroots award, which is the UEFA B award. Um, and I still deliver those. Um, Unfortunately, because of the COVID, there was a, a series of us that uh, unfortunately were made redundant. And um, I've since moved on to Arsenal Football Club now, um, where I do a sort of fairly similar thing in educating 
um, and developing staff, the academy staff, or certainly the pre-academy staff, um, and also sort of qu quite heavily involved really in the uh, stars of the future. So the ones that we can sign from the age of nine and that can train with us and, uh, and, and, and play with us on weekends as well. So um, in a nutshell, that's, that, that's where I am really. But I think, um, again, many thanks to for Dion for inviting me to this because, um, you know, as coaches and as practitioners, we, we need to make sure that we're um, constantly learning and we're open and we're susceptible to new ideas uh, and new advice. And I think certainly I, I, I found that out when I when I when I started working for the Football Association that, um, you know, I was heavily focused on the technical side of the game. But there's so many different facets involved with coaching, as you guys will know. And the technical side was just a, um, a small part. So I thought I'd look at look at developing an, uh, a, a playing and coaching philosophy. And I have to stress this is um, this is not Arsenal's one. This is this is mine that I put together. But really, I suppose it's just to um, create um, some thought and some ideas, and sharing different ways of working, if you like, um, of how we might go about creating and developing a, a playing and coaching philosophy. So the aims of this workshop. We're going to highlight the importance of a philosophy within grassroots football, define what a philosophy is and explore why having a philosophy is important. Um, it will be mostly me. There is some um, videos that I'd like to share with you. And also I'd like us where we can to populate the chat box as well. I've got two screens going at the minute, so I can see the chat box as well. So there'll be a little function on here also. Um, so the first thing is a little bit of an icebreaker, I suppose. And really, we can start off with a chat box now is, is, is what do you see first, as individuals looking at the screen? What do you see first? Do you see letters first or numbers first? So this is a little little bit of fun little icebreaker for us all. Um, I saw numbers first. Numbers, brilliant. Yeah, you can either populate the chat box or come off mute, no problem. I saw both numbers and letters. Fantastic. I saw letters first. Letters, brilliant. Okay. This is one of my favorites. Whether you like ketchup, you don't like ketchup, you like brown sauce, hot sauce, whatever it is, whatever condiment it is, do you keep it in the fridge or in the cupboard? The fridge or the cupboard? Where would you keep it? Fridge. Oh, the fridge. Anyone for the cupboard? Cupboard. <laughs> cupboard. I live in the cupboard. We live in Trinidad. It's too hot for the cover. It's got to be the fridge. Yeah. The fridge. Okay. I am. Um, what am I? I'm fridge. My wife is the cupboard. There you go. Let's go with, particularly in this uh, pandemic that we find ourselves in. So you haven't seen a, you're a very good friend in a long time. What do you do to say hello? Would you shake their hand? politely like we might do over here or would you reach in and give them a hug when we're allowed to what would you do handshake or hug neither right now so after the pandemic what would you do a bounce and shake into a hug a bounce a bounce and shake into a hug okay yeah okay i like it Mark, when we All say right. Mark, Mark, sorry, when so, we say when we say bounce, it's like taking the knuckles and going like that. So that's how some people treat themselves. Right, okay. <laughs> a fist bump. A fist, fist bump. bump. Okay, so I split this into three sections, if you like. So the first section is on what is a philosophy. So I just want you guys to just have a think about what a philosophy is to you, um, and why you've arrived with this definition. Just have a think about it. Um, if you want to jot it down, if you want to come off mute, that's fine. If not, don't worry. But I want it to be thought provoking. Um, and why I say that is because the English Football Association, when I was there, we were very big in terms of a, a playing philosophy of working through the thirds of a pitch. 
So that transition, if you like, from our goalkeeper in the defensive third going into the middle third, into the attacking third. Um, but then my job as a, as a tutor at that time was to go around and observe some of the coaches as part of their education. But a lot of them would be playing this way. But when I asked the question why, quite often than not, there were sort of blank faces. So for me, it is what is a philosophy and, you know, how have you arrived at this definition? Even if we don't get to answer that now, I just want it to be thought provoking when you go away from here. Um, so some of the answers that I've come up with here is uh, a way of thinking about the world, the universe and society. The study of general and fundamental problems, um, an exploration of one's beliefs, a vision or a set of values that you live by a system of values, beliefs, and behaviours. So I coached a, a, a five-year-old team, an under-five-year-old team, going back probably about 10 years. And believe it or not, we started off with a basic philosophy then. So they were playing um, five-a-side. They played five-a-side. They had one goalkeeper and four outfield players. So my question, uh, and, I, and I wanted to be quite expansive, and my question to the players at five was, um, when we are in possession of the football, uh, how do we want to play? So we decided as a group that we wanted to be expansive and make the pitch really, really big. With four players, I asked the five-year-olds what shape we could make out of four. So most of them said a square. So we said, right, we're going to have a square and we're going to make the square big when we've got the ball and we're going to make the square small when we haven't got the ball, make it difficult for the other team. That was it at that age. Why? because they're five, um, and that was the limit for me. They knew what a shape was. Can you try and stay in that square? We're going to make the square big when we've got it, smaller when we haven't got it. Obviously, when you're working with different age groups, then you can layer on and layer on and, and, and be a bit more um, thorough with it. But that was the start of a basic uh, philosophy then. So why is a philosophy important and what is its purpose? Um, and who is your club for? What do, why do the players play? What do you value as a coach? And who else needs to be on board? So let's go back to why is a philosophy important and what's its purpose? Does anyone want to go into the chat box or, or come off? And by the way, I want this to be a safe space for learning to take place. So there's no wrong answers here. Um, I'm, not, I'm not looking for you to um, come up with an answer that you think that I'm thinking of. Just be uh, really sincere and come up with an answer that you think is right. So why is a philosophy important? All right, so Alexandra, Alexandra had her hand up. So you guys use the, um, use the mechanism where you can put your hand up. So Alexandra, you can go for this, please. Thanks so much, Dion, and uh, hi to you, Mark. Um, no. I think philosophy is important uh, because it's sort of the core or foundational uh, whatever you want to call it, group of beliefs, ethos, driver that you draw from. So your um, philosophy effectively should be a reference point. It's the thing that you come back to every time um, you do what you do. So why am I coaching this particular thing? What part of my philosophy am I drawing from? Whether yeah. it's to have fun or, you know, to experience, um, you know, to create better or, or, or more technically um, skilled players, whatever it might be. Um, and then ultimately I've answered the second question, what's its purpose? Yeah. It's, it's the driver, it's, it's the engine room for, for moving forward. So. Yeah. Uh, Alexandra, that is a fantastic answer and I'm glad you used the words uh, point of reference as well. Um, I, I played semi-professional football for, for about 15 years in England um, and I'm going to be totally honest with you. And I, the managers and coaches that I played under, I, 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 I can't tell you an identity um, a style that we played in with the ball and without the ball and in positive and negative transit. I couldn't tell you what it was. So then it lends itself to no point of reference. It lends itself to then jargon um, <coughs> when, you're in, when you're in possession of the ball and also at half time. So there's lots of jargon and there's lots of generalizations of we're not doing this and we're not doing that rather than specifics. So the point of reference there will lend itself to the, you being able to uh, pinpoint specifics and say, right, 
you know, we said in possession of the ball, we said as a group that we wanted to be expansive and play through the third to the pitch. That's not happening. Why not? Or out of possession, we said that we wanted to press high in the final third and be aggressive with that press to try and win the ball back. That hasn't happened. Why not? Or there might be different triggers in there that you use that uh, when the opposition have a poor first touch, then we're going to really press to try and win the ball back. Or if it's a square pass or um, if they if if they face the other way or their eyes aren't looking, boom, that's the trigger to go and press. But again, all these things might come into that philosophy and it will depend for me on what age you're working with um, in terms of how much detail you go on. So that was a fantastic answer, to that, Alexandra. Thank you. Mark, I'm going to ask I'm going to ask Judy what put her, put a, a remark in the chat. Judy, can you unmute yourself and make that point, please, to Mark, please? Judy, can you make unmute yourself and make that point to Mark, please? Um, it's not Judy, it's Junior. <laughs> junior, sorry, Junior. Junior Franklin. I call you Judy, buddy. Sorry. Yeah, that's because I use my wife's laptop. <laughs> oh, my apologies. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to find what I just put there. Um, I I said it was a guide um to help in in, in going forward. Yeah. In a okay. particular direction. Yeah. And let let's just do one more. MTRs. MTRs. Can you unmute yourself and make 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 the point, please? MTRs, please. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um. um Good morning, morning. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, so my concept of philosophy is um is is one where it evolves, right? From the um the academic junior level to the professional level, it you use philosophy in different um ways. Um when you get to the the professional level, those big teams could afford to have a plain philosophy. Right, so Liverpool has their philosophy, the high press. Um, you would you would find um, Atletico with their philosophy. You will have the philosophy in the Italian league, which which is more defensive. Um, you'll have the tiki taka in um, Barcelona, right? So when you get to that level, you can establish a philosophy in terms of your brand and your brand identity. But at the junior level, and the um, academic level, your philosophy to me should not be on the playing field. It should, your philosophy should be a concept in terms of your um, your beliefs and your values, which drives your decision that you make for the club. So that um, things like um, inclusiveness, things like um, things like um, everybody gets um, a turn. Um, in terms of um, because at that level, to to say, okay, well, we play defensive, right? Or we play in a low block. Um, you can't set that because the, the, the pool that you're getting from is a large pool. You have players of different caliber. So then mm -hmm. you can't say we play in a, 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 a possession-based game when the majority of your, 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 your players mm -hmm. are not possession-based players. They are more, more suited to a certain type of, um, of, of play, which is more of a low block, mm -hmm. right? And you don't want to bottleneck yourself. You don't want to pinhole yourself at that early stage in development. Development, let your philosophy evolve. Right? So that, that's my take. Yeah. That's a, that's a fantastic answer. So <clears throat> there is a difference between a playing philosophy and a coaching philosophy. Um, so I get the coaching philosophy, and I think you're absolutely right. That's our... Uh, values and beliefs and everything is underpinned by that and also I think yeah it, it, we don't want to pigeonhole but I think if you looked at um, Arsenal with our youngsters we, we have a playing philosophy if you like and a real identity and when I watch these youngsters these and I'm talking under nines when I go and watch them it is very very clear to see and this is this is the philosophy I'm giving you a real insight now but it is as simple as our players need to be comfortable <clears throat> um, on the ball and to stay on the ball. They need to stay on the ball. Um, we don't we don't really talk about passing and passing through the thirds of the pitch and uh, crossfield passes or anything like that. The players have um, will come in two times, three times a week. There's various different skills um, techniques that we'll, we'll we'll teach them and we'd encourage them to use them in the game. And then in possession, we let they're free. 
They're free to express themselves. Stay on the ball. Share it with someone if you need to. So the rationale behind that is then when um, the pitch opens out into 11 v 11, um, we can then get them to get their heads up and look at um, a different range of passing, etc. But hopefully by then we've created and nurtured real um, refined technical players that are comfortable with the ball and that can dominate 1v1 situations. That, that, that's our ideation at, at that. Now, every club will be completely different. I'm talking about professional academy football. I'm talking about a, a, a Premier League club, which that's our philosophy. Academy footballs, I agree, is going to be totally different. And I think it might be more towards that coaching philosophy where it is, you know, this is what we're about. These are our values. Um, as Alexandria said just a second ago, it might be that it's fun. We're here to have fun. That is one of our key values. That's what we want to make sure that we will adhere to. So, um, you, you know, you're right, but it depends, I suppose, on that setting and where you're working and um, who you're working with, the personnel, because there's no point in setting, um, like you alluded to then, a, you know, a high press or being able to dominate possession and play out from the back if you've got players that unfortunately aren't able to do it. Um, so the purpose, if you like, is everyone pointing in the same direction. I think we've covered these. A golden thread that runs throughout your club, be a part of something bigger, a useful filter. It's a direction for coaches as well. I think this is easy with coaches. So, for example, where I am now and certainly with the FA, there's a blueprint, if you like, a skeleton of this is how we'd like to do it. But with coaches, we want you to use free expression within that and be creative within that. You know, we want to play out from the back or we want to press high or we want to stay on the ball as long as we can. That's fine. But you be creative in that. We don't want to create a series of uh, robots that are running around. Um, and, and it helps with volunteers that come into the club also. I want to play this video now. And we've done a little test and I hope the sound works. Um, you would have probably seen the film, but there's a reason why I want to, why I want to show this. And it links into something that we've said already. Um, it's a film, uh, Blindside, with uh, Sandra Bullock. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't. But um, have a look. It is a few minutes long, but enjoy it. Right, right, right. Right, right, right. Can you hear the sound, Dion? If you can just give me a thumbs up. Yeah, perfect. Roll three, roll three, roll three. Thank you. Let's go. got 100 pounds on Collis and you can't keep him out of our backfield, hold your block until the whistle blows. Hold. All right, let's go. All right, Mark, you there? Yeah. So maybe, the camera. Oh, it's playing. It's fine. Yeah. does better when he sees what he's supposed to be doing. Holding. Left tackle. Michael, come on. Or? Come here, son. You're going to hold him. Hold him inside here between the tits. You got it? Would you look at me, son? If you grab them outside here like this with that horse collar thing you just did, you're gonna get flagged and I'm gonna be pissed. You hear me? All right, let's go. Baby, wash my stuff, all right? Okay. Well, at least it looked good coming off the bus. I'll be terrified till they realize he's a marshmallow. Looks like Tarzan plays like Jane. Give me a minute, Bert. We're in the middle of practice, Leanne. You can thank me later. Come here. Michael, do you remember when we first met and we went to that horrible part of town to buy you those dreadful clothes? 
and I was a little bit scared, and you told me not to worry about it because you had my back. Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. And if anyone tried to get to me, you would have stopped them, right? And when you and SJ were in that car wreck, what did you do to the airbag? Stopped it. You stopped it. You stopped it. This team is your family, Michael. You have to protect them from those guys, OK? Listen. OK. Tony here is your quarterback, all right? You protect his blind side. When you look at him, you think of me, how you have my back, how you have his, OK? All right, Tony, go back. Oompa Loompa here is your tailback. When you look at him, you think of SJ and how you've never let anyone or anything hurt him. You understand me? All right, go back. Got it? What about Collins and Mr. Tui? Fine, they can be on the team too. Are you gonna protect the family, Michael? Yes, ma'am. Good boy, then go have some fun. Yelling at him doesn't work, Bert. Doesn't trust men. In his experience, they pretend to care about you till they disappear. Want to run a play? SJ, you're going to want to get this. Okay. Come on, Say to him. You should get to know your players, Bert. He tested 98% in protective instincts. I said you could thank me later. It's later, Bert. Okay. Um, I don't know if you've seen that film, but uh, a, a, a fascinating film, and I love it because it, it really focuses in on knowing your players. And I think it's one thing having a philosophy and a, a, a set way of playing. But if you don't know your personnel within that, I think you're going to run into difficulties along the way. So a couple of examples um, I've got is, uh, number one, definitely is a preferred learning style. So I have different ways that I prefer to learn. So I'm more of a kinesthetic learner. So someone who likes doing things. Um, probably more visual than auditory as well. And there'd be um, people on this call that are completely different, which was the reason for the exercise at the start with the ketchup, um, with the handshakes, we're all completely different. There'll be people on this call that will be making copious amounts of notes and jotting everything down. And there'll be people thinking, when's this dude gonna finish talking so we can get ready for the game? I get it, I totally get it, I totally get it, but we're all different. We're all completely different. So an example today, we set up, we had, we, we had an academy game against Brighton today and we had a little team meeting at the start and uh, some of the coaches said to me, right, can you go and set up on this pitch out there? We're going to have four rotations, these amount of players you're going to have, et cetera, et cetera. And I did not have a clue what he was talking about. And I think the Mark Rivers 10 years ago would have just kind of got on with it and just tried to maybe have a look and see what they were doing. But I just asked someone to write it down for me. And they just drew two simple squares with pic pitches in um, and a couple of arrows of the rotation, the way we're going to rotate. And I got it straight away. So I think we've got to cater for our young players and how different they are. And also, I think um, 
Another example at Academy, and I think I might have shared this with Dion, was, um, you know, one player that came from a split family. So at weekends would spend um, time with his dad at some weekends, uh, once a month, I think it was. But the time that he spent with his dad, um, unfortunately, his dad um, was a bit more sort of relaxed in terms of um, his parenting styles. The young lad was allowed to stay up late and eat sweets. So it affected his mood next day at training. So it was a little simple question that the coach asked um, when they connected at the start was, oh, did you have a good weekend? Where did you go? So if he knew that his son was his dad's and he knew that he'd have to um, maybe talk to him or challenge him in a slightly different way and his energy levels would be different versus staying at his mum. So I just thought that was... Um, was quite interesting, and I think from my own experience as a as a as a player, um, where managers have just used that auditory fashion, if you like, to sh to shout and scream, it didn't really do a lot for me. Um, knowledge always impressed me. Someone who spoke in a calm manner, that's how I took on information. But um, some might have responded well to to being shouted at, but I wasn't one of them. Um, so when we're developing uh, a coaching philosophy, we need to be clear of why our club exists. We engage, engage with coaches, parents and volunteers. So Dion said at the start about stakeholders, these would be some of our stakeholders. You know, and I would want to encourage, certainly a grassroots team, the uh, parents and volunteers um, to, to understand our philosophy and what we we're about. You know, when I go out with my football association hat on, um, I would encourage managers to do the team talk in earshot of some of the parents. I don't know what it's like um, there, but in this country, it's kind of parents stay this side of the pitch, coaches go over that side, and it's like this big secret, um, the way that we're going to play, when in actual fact, we're all on the same team. You know, our, our parents were all on the same team. And also, I think it eradicates sometimes, and I had it today, actually, where you get some parents that are shouting things out that maybe contradict the way that you want to do things and go about things. Whereas if you were more open and transparent with your philosophy and the parents were allowed some form of buy-in, then maybe they're on your team a little bit more and they understand what you're trying to do rather, sh rather than shouting things out that may differ. From, from from what you're trying to do. Um, so again, maybe some of these are the things that we need to include. So coaching styles, what sort of way are we going to play? Um, and as someone said earlier, you know, this can be uh, fluid, we can change all the time, but um, we've got an idea. What's the capabilities of the players that we're working, working with? Are we asking them to do something that's too sort of far out? Um, is there a player development? Uh, program in place where we can challenge and push these players and what do the coaching practices look like so for me they have to be um, and, and mirror the game where they can so um, the game of football is random um, the game of football is an invasion game where we're protecting one thing the goal behind me and we're attacking the other goal it's an invasion game same as basketball same as hockey same as netball so the closer we can stay on point with that, the better for me. There's there's um, lots of sessions that I see that are too fragmented and that are too different from the game. So the big jump of going from drills, and English FA, we don't use the word drills anymore. We call them practices. We felt that using the word drills was too regimental. Um, and we call them constant practices. So if I've got a tennis ball and I throw it to Dion, Dion catches it, throws it back to me. We could probably do that for half an hour, no problem. Challenge, could I do it with one eye shut? Yeah. Could I do it standing on one leg? Yeah, I could still do it. But then we play in a game that's random and it's too far detached. So where we can make that, we can bring them closer for, for, for us is much better. Um, so my philosophy, if you like, um, when I had a, a university team over here as a counter-attacking style, um, we'd counter-attack in three different ways, a classic over-the-top style or exploiting 2v1s, 3v2s, solo bursts through. Um, we'd win the ball back by being in a, a medium to low block and being very compact. Um, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a second, what I mean by compact. Um, preferred playing style will be one four four three, and that's something else that we've kind of gone away from here because when I was growing up, four four three—that's what we'd say four four three, um, four three three. Sorry, 
but we'd um, we'd miss out the goalkeeper, so we put the one in front. So I mentioned earlier, this is my, how we might go about it. So using triggers such as a poor first touch, a square pass, it might be our number eight, we call it setting traps. It might be the number eight that presses first. That's the trigger then for, let's say, the number seven and number 11 to go together to try and uh, cause the opposition some problems. Some of my values, um, and this took me, believe it or not, a good couple of hours to come up with these three words. So integrity is massive to me. Um, it's really, really huge. So I would, I would do things in my session. I plan out things. I spend equal time planning, doing, and reviewing everything, whether there's someone watching me or not, whether my boss is there on my shoulder, whether there's, we call it surveillance, whether there's any form of surveillance or not. That's integrity to me and being true to myself. I uh, come from a, uh, an empathetic uh, viewpoint as, um, you know, I've been that player that stood in a drill where it's pouring down with rain uh, and I'm talked at for, for 20 minutes. I don't, I don't, I didn't like that. I don't want my players. I want my players to be moving all the time. I want them to be scoring goals. Why have we got to wait to the end of the session with 10 minutes left before we play a match? Why can't we play a match at the start? You know, um, certainly with our under 11s, we would play a match at the start as soon as they arrive. We wouldn't spend time running them around the outside of pitches. Certainly at under 11s, um, we'd, we'd want to maximise time in random settings in, in, in the game. And being respectful, being respectful to, you know, the coaches, the staff, being respectful to yourselves as well. Um, and for me, it's this journey, I suppose, from being good to excellent. I was fortunate enough to work with uh, Leicester City's manager, Brendan Rodgers. Uh, formerly of Liverpool and Celtic, we worked together for five years at, uh, at Reading Football Club, and, and one of his sayings was just stuck with me: it "Was being good is comfortable, and being excellent is uncomfortable." So we can all be good, um, and people will give you that little tap on the back, and well done. But to be excellent, sometimes you've got to put yourself in uncomfortable situations, and. And by that, I mean, it might be getting up earlier than you normally would do or, you know, really reviewing your session afterwards rather than just, um, you know, getting in your car and driving home. Um, really dissecting yourself as a coach, looking at yourself in the mirror, all of those sort of things. And I mentioned this to Dion on the call the other day, but, you know, if you are going to be outwardly facing, you need to be inwardly credible. So if we are going to be outward facing and we are going to say, right, this is what we're about. This is what we stand for. These are our key values that we want to adhere to. Then um, we need to make sure that we're, we're really living those because we're living in a time where, um, you know, there's lots of people and lots of coaches and teams on my travels have these wonderful acronyms and key values. But uh, are we really living them? Mark, let me cut you for a sec. Let me cut you yes. for a sec. The, the slides are very blurry, so I'm not sure why, because it, um, it, it's blurry. Is there a way we could, and if that's, if that's it, no problem, I could always share the, the slides with the guys after, but it's just blurry from our end. Okay, I'll see what I can do, but if not, um, I've sent the slides to Dion, so um, Dion, feel free to share them out afterwards, um, sure. and hopefully you can pick them up from there, yeah. Okay, so in essence, it was a golden thread, really, that that, that runs through um, through what you're what you're about to get from good to excellent. You need to make sure that all these things exist. I don't know if you can see these. This 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 would be integral to me um, from a coaching philosophy point of view. There's um, twelve hexagons. Whether you can see them or not, that's fine. I'll uh, go through yeah. them. Yeah, Mark, sorry, just so somebody had put in the chat, um, try optimizing the something. I'm not too too familiar with it. Okay. Um, yeah, do you have an idea? You have an idea? Yeah, we've, I think I did that at the start. Yeah. Yeah, you did that at the start. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's no problem. I can I can I can talk for it, no problem. No problem. Um, so so for me, this is a good start. So if you haven't got a, a, a philosophy or, or or a coaching or playing philosophy, this relates to a coaching philosophy, which was um which was mentioned at the start. So it might be worth uh, having a play around with this if, if you haven't got one, but this is a good point of reference for me. So, so number one would be using a positive and enthusiastic manner at all times. So that should be a given for me, regardless of um, what's happened in your life that day. It might be your players 
uh, only chance of exercise that day, their first experience of football that day. So we need to be positive and energetic. The next one going across to me is delivering a realistic games related practice, making sure it's realistic to the real game of football. In games, whenever we can, in training, um, developing practices that are, enable the players to make lots of decisions. So again, going back to that point where I'm throwing a tennis ball to Dion, the success rate is really, really high and the success rate will go through the roof, but decision making is really low. And if you think about in a game, the amount of decisions you'd have to make in a split second, for me, we can use the time in the training session to really maximise that as well. Um, connection with the players before, um, if any of you are into basketball, Steve Kerr, who played with Michael Jordan um, at the Red Bulls, uses this fantastic phrase, in my opinion, that, uh, that says connection before correction. So having that form of connection with the group beforehand. Um, value work across the four corners. So if you're not familiar, in, the, in, in, in England, we have four corners which say technical, social, physical and psychological, not in that order. So what's happening in the technical box? What are you doing there? What is your learning outcome for that session? So have you planned it out? What is it you're trying to do? Socially, what are the returns? What do you expect to happen socially? And it can't be for me all about talking and, and we don't talk enough because um, if you see some of our under eights at the minute, you, on the pitch, they're not going to say anything. Yet they're probably one of the best sets of under eights in the country, but they're not going to talk. So where else can we focus our energy socially? Because we can do things like non-verbals, eye contact, hand signals, those sorts of things, body language. So it hasn't, we haven't got to focus our energy as coaches on them being not talking enough, in my opinion. Um, physical, what's happening physically. So certainly the under 11s physically might be the range of movements. So the hopping, the skipping, the jumping, the walking, the running, the sprinting, all of which are transferable to different sports also. Um, you're going to get the same range of movements in basketball, in hockey, in netball, all exactly the same. Um, and then psychologically, what decisions are being made? Are our players making the right decisions most of the time? So I think if you're starting to look at uh, players in your system, if they've got something in those four boxes, I think you're on to a winner. I remember growing up with um, some real good technical players that were were fantastic in two boxes, the technical and the physical box, but they were missing something in the other two. So unfortunately, they didn't end up making the grade. So I think if you think about most of your favourite players, they should have something in each of those um, boxes. Valuing your work across, um, sorry, spending equal time planning, doing and reviewing, which is huge. So planning out what you're going to do that evening, um, actually going and delivering it. And then probably the most important is reviewing it. And you might be able to review it quickly. The players will give you feedback potentially. And I think when we can relinquish power as coaches and as practitioners, that's when a lot of learning can take place. And what I mean is um, if I've set the pitch up incorrectly, so I can't really get my topic out of what I'm coaching because the pitch is too small. I need to recognize that and hold my hand up and say, hold on a minute, kids, I've just made a slight error here. Let me just adjust the sides of the pitch because I'm not going to get the returns from it. And then what my coaches have ended up doing is pointing the finger at me or as us as kids. And it's not our fault. When you can relinquish that kind of power, I think that is, that is hugely powerful. Gareth Southgate did it really well the England national teams whereby he would ask um, players so which makes perfect sense to me so it might be um, let's say attacking set pieces um, to the players can you give me an example of how you might have done a practical set piece at your club so let's say he's used six players um, they've given him three different examples that's 18 different free kicks that he might have 18 versus him saying, no, this is the way we've always done it. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go with my one. And I think that's really powerful for the players then, um, really beneficial for them, and it empowers them also. 
Um, another part of my coaching philosophy would be to use a carousel system, which I'm sure you guys will do. But um, so rather than doing one session and then getting a drink and then asking the players to wait, five minutes whilst you set up the next thing can you have those three or four things already in place so it might be that you do it inside of the football pitch so I've got the pitch for the game at the start then I've got some practices set up maybe with some flat discs or something then you can pick those discs up and guess what you've got your pitch there set out already so it eradicates any uh, wasted time it eradicates poor behavior and it keeps your players entertained all the time um, a variety of different coaching styles as well, making sure that you use what we call um, command style. So it's a bit more you tell, they listen, but then also some question and answer. You know, what do you think about this? What could you have done there? Some guided discovery as well. So I know the actual answer, but I'm guiding them to get to that answer. So using different styles. I'm guessing most of us on the call our experiences with our first coaches, it would have been right. I'm the, they're the coach. They tell us what to do and we do it. But what opportunities have we got in that to um, express ourselves as players? And the last one, which is actually quite difficult, I think, but what, what, what the FA tried to get across was 70% ball rolling. So trying to ensure in your sessions, and you can do it, you can time yourselves, is the ball moving 70% of the time? So for us, it was... Um, certainly with the under 11s, come in, play straight away. So if um, if Dion and myself were the first people to arrive at that training session, we would play each other on a small pitch, 1v1. Someone else joined, it was 2v1. Someone else, 2v2, and so on, until we get to 4v4 or 5v5, build up the next pitch. Then we'll come away, do whatever that practice was for that day, and then we would return to the game at the end. We would call that whole part whole. Hole is the game, part, break away to do the practice and then revisit the second hole, which is almost like uh, an exam at the end just for them to show you what they've learned. So clear playing philosophy, some of the statements, in possession, out of possession, um, transition um, and formation. So again, it's how deep you want to go, go into it. It might be three things in possession, three things out of possession, positive and negative transition. We've got the ball. We've lost it. Ah, what do we? Ha what do you want to happen? Or uh, we have we we've we've won the ball back. Now we're in transition. What do you want us to do? How do you want us to exploit the space? So just some advice and making sure that we include our goalkeepers in this also. Okay, I'm just going to play a couple of minutes of the next slide. This is a, an example, if you like, of uh, Germany's playing philosophy. Talking in my sleep at night, making myself crazy. Wrote it down and read it out, hoping it would save me. Too many times, too many times. My love, it makes it feel like nobody else, nobody else. But my love, he doesn't love me, so I tell myself, I tell myself. One, don't pick up the phone. You know he's only calling because he's drunk and alone. Two, don't let him in, you have to kick him out again Three, don't be his friend You know you're gonna wake up in his bed in the morning And if you're under him, you ain't getting over him I got no rules, I count him I got no rules, I count him Guys, I'm actually gonna stop it there because I, there's three things that come from that for me And it does go on and get a bit more advanced But the first one was look forward but don't rush. So that might be a part of your attacking philosophy. I want my teams or players to look to play forward straight away. My goalkeeper, can you play forward straight away? Um, goalkeepers uh, to create an overload. So if you've seen with Neuer, they're always available to create a, a numerical advantage. And the third one they had was play with patience. Keep the ball, draw the other team onto you to maybe create 
um, and exploit behind them. So just three different examples that maybe you could use um, going forward if you if you hadn't already. And I mentioned earlier about compactness, and I want to come back to that in a second. But this 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 is uh, how I might have set the pitch up. And again, it's it's not Arsenal. This is more um, when I was at the the, the English FA. Um, and you would have seen this, but it's three, five lanes. So 11 a size pit pitch, five lanes, one, two, three, four, five. So you've got the outside lanes. You've got the half space in between, the central lane three, and then it goes out the same the other side. So um, another way of playing in possession for me would be to make sure we occupy all of those five lanes of the pitch. So have I got someone in the outside lane, the half space, the central lane, and the same the other side? Because uh, that's how we're going to play. Big, wide, expansive football, height, width, depth. That's how I want to do it. Maybe, if that's the way I want to play. I've seen it done with three lanes as well. Um, three big lanes. But also, when we talk about compactness as well, I think it helps also because, um, you know, compactness is a defensive principle of play, but sometimes it's just used as a bit of a buzzword and chucked out there. So compactness for me in this system, if the opposition have got the ball in a central area, then compactness is in the half space, central lane and half space. A reference point on the pitch would be if you were to draw a line between the edge of the 18 yard box, right up to the edge of the other 18 yard box and the same the other side, that's where I'd want all of my players inside there if they were attacking centrally. The trade-off being then um, they exploit the wide areas and you have to deal with the crosses. But that will depend on your philosophy. What I think other coaches in my experience have failed to ask at that situation is how um, the goalkeeper, does the goalkeeper prefer to come for crosses or deal with shots? So that might depend and lend itself to that also. So that's one little way. It might be as simple as that. Can we play with the five lanes? And if you look at the five lanes, an 11 aside pitch um, will do it for you. So the edge of the 18 to the edge of the 18, that's the outside lane. The half space is the edge of the six yard box, straight up to the other edge of the six yard box. That's a half space. Central lane then you can see, and it replicates the same the other side. So when you watch the Champions League later on, Pep Guardiola really likes his players to operate in those half spaces and create attacks that start in there, where players are really difficult to pick up and difficult to mark. Um, so moving on, this is on the slides as well. This is the uh, coaching palette, if you like, that will um, is designed to, to sort of help you out in your practice. So thinking about uh, what you're delivering, what's the topic, what's the purpose? Is it an out of possession topic? Is it in possession? What aspect of the game is it? What's the format of the game? Is it 11 v 11 that you're coaching? 9 v 9, 7 v 7? What percentage of the players do you have? Um, the practice spectrum is interesting to me. So is it constant, variable or random? So we've spoken about the game being random. So for me, all our sessions need to, to, to go that way. Having said that, of course, there's plenty of time in the game uh, in training for constant practices. Teams do it all the time. They'll come out and um, get the ball moving. But for me, if we can make it to the random, that's great. The variable might be a constant practice. Let's say that we've added in some de defenders or some slight um, amendments. That means there's some movement there. So it's not entirely um, static. Um, but there's an example of constant variable random. If you've got an opportunity to work in uh, the whole of the pitch, what area of the pitch relates to the topic that you're working on. So is it the uh, back third, middle third or, or, or front third? What's the focus player? Are you working with defenders, midfielders or forwards? Um, practice format, is it whole part whole? Uh, TGFU, I'm sure you guys are familiar, but is, is teaching games for understanding. So it's something that I'm big on, um, uh, games based. So it is um, games rather than sort of old fashioned drills, so to speak. Um, constraints based might be that we put constraints in. So it might be things like um, uh, you can only take one touch or three or more. So if you think about that again, you can only take one touch or three or more. 
So a go-to challenge in, in England when I was growing up was one touch. But then if you if you plonk a Lionel Messi in your session or a, or a Ronaldo and you say to them they're limited to one touch, their game's going to be gone. You, you're, you're nullifying a lot of their game. One touch or three or more gets them to think about um, if there's pressure on, if they need to release the ball versus actually I've got space to move into or to keep the ball, so I'm going to stay on it. So that might be one way of constraining it. It might be... Um, uh, you're you're uh, two free touch in your own half, but you're unlimited when you get into their half. It might be because there's an overload and I've got seven versus six in my training session because uh, one of the girls or boys is, is sick. Then I might say, right, the team with six, you are winning one nil. It's the FA Cup final, but unfortunately, one of your players has been sent off. Um, so deal with that. It might be that um, you can only win one nil. Think about that. You can only win one nil. So game management. If you score a goal, can you get back and make it difficult for the other team to 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 get through? So little ideas um, from a coaching philosophy point of view. Um, so I'd want to focus on the uh, learning environment. This is crucial to me and developing coaching practices that are age appropriate, fun, safe, and enjoyable. It has to be age appropriate. Am I asking my under eights to run around the pitch 25 times? Um, am I asking them to be doing press ups and, and waiting in line drills where they have one shot on goal and then they've got to go to the back of a queue where they're waiting another 20 minutes? No, that's not for me a positive learning environment where learning is going to take place. They're going to, they will do it, of course they will, because I'm the, I'm the coach. And if I ask them to run around the pitch 20 times, of course they'll do it. But um, can you set something up that's related to the game that's fun and enjoyable? Is it challenging? Practices should include chaos and speed bumps. The game's chaotic. It looks messy. If you were to look at tonight's game, Champions League or this afternoon for you guys and take a, a, an, a you were lucky enough to go up in a helicopter and look down, it will look totally messy and random. So let's replicate that in the game. There you go. Practice should look like that three o'clock kickoff to create good decision makers um, and promote autonomy as well. They should develop game understanding and create good decision makers. So in my sort of coaching philosophy, if you like, these would be the stages of a typical um, session for me. So, so I've got an hour, let's say, with this group of players. It'd be four different stages. So number one would be uh, player ownership. It says the coach there, but it'd be owned by the players as they come in. Um, it would be uh, games based. It would be small sided games to start. Then we'd look at um, some football action. So it might be some sort of uh, curver stuff, some quick feet stuff, some skills and tricks that they would do owned by them and partly owned by me. Then we'd go into some conditioned practices, um, which I just talked about that, that relate to the game. So in none of this would there be sort of drills and long lines and cues, et cetera. And then fourth is um, back into the game, almost like a little bit of an exam, if you like, where they can go back in and, and put all what they've learned into that last game. So that'd be sort of four sections for me, if you like. Uh, this is just an example of if you're lucky enough to have a 11 aside pitch, um, of, 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 of the areas of the pitch that you might try and work in to make it realistic. So if I'm working with the midfielders in this area or I'm creating a low block, let's say, then I might operate in these areas, 5, 8 and 11 on a pitch um, and try and make it realistic. If it's anything um, like it is in this country, we haven't got access to 11 by 11 size pitches. We're on smaller pitches, um, astro pitches. So we've got to try and be as creative as we can be. Um, challenging is really big for us. So we'd make sure that we challenge the individuals within the group. Um, we'd have unit challenges. So it might be a challenge for the back four, uh, challenge for the midfield, uh, challenge for the strikers. And as I said, something individually and collective team challenges as well. Can you go this game without uh, without conceding? Um, whatever it may be, a realistic and achievable challenge. What does anyone notice about this picture? It's 
Ki a volna Spurs a Nanász? Nem csak a Spurs, nem. Spurs a Nanász, nem. I don't know what's going on here, but for me, I, it, it's around effective communication. This is a cardinal sin. Um, North London rivals, but uh, I don't know what's happened here. The communication has been poor, but communication for me is a, is a, is essential, you know. And I think asking that group of players as well, being able to stand back. And I encourage a lot of our coaches, whether it's in a pre academy at Arsenal, whether it's with my my FA hat on, once the practice is up and running, stand back and and, and breathe a little bit. Let the play go on because sometimes we're we're in amongst it all. And it's a hundred miles an hour. And we can't see the wood for the trees. So it's this expression of coming out, stepping out of the frame to be able to see the picture. And it's uncomfortable for some coaches. It really is to stand out um, and not say anything for a while. It can be really uncomfortable, especially when you've got um, those key stakeholders that are behind you. Um, whether it's those, you know, the technical directors and the, the uh, heads of coaching, or it might be the parents, whoever it is, it's very difficult to stand out and just observe for a little bit. But it just gives you a little bit of time. And also, I think being brave enough to ask the players, whether it's part of your um, review at the end, you know, how, how, did, how do you think I did? What could we do better next time? What, what amendments can we make? That's huge. I really think it is. And also in session as well, when you can recognise, when you've stood out and you recognise, is this practice working? If it is brilliant, if not, why not? And be able to go in and change it. For me, that is hugely powerful. There's an, there's an acronym that um, we use quite a lot over here called the uh, STEP principle. I don't know if you're familiar with it. And again, I'm not, I'm not massive on, on acronyms. Sometimes I think... Um, people do it the wrong way around they create a fancy word first and then try and shoehorn lots of different words in there but the step one related to coaching i think is brilliant so the s in step is space so is the space right for this session t is task is the task relevant for that group of players that i'm working with is it relevant am i asking them to do things that are just beyond their years e equipment and by that, I mean, obviously, you know, the right size footballs and bibs and everything, but also do you need to add cones in? Do you need to take cones away? Do you need to cone certain areas off of a pitch if you haven't got players there? Um, do you need to add goals in? What do you need to do? So is that right? And I think P, the last one, P is players. So do I need to, um, if I'm doing a shooting practice for, for, for argument's sake, um, and um, I'm not getting success from the shooting, in other words, there's no goals going in because I've got a goalkeeper and maybe a couple of defenders. It might mean that I've got to take one of those defenders out um, or take a goalkeeper out. And I don't mean out, out the session, but join in with something else um, to get the success rate high and then maybe add some challenges in, they can go back in again. Um, but that little acronym there might stand you in um, good stead. And I put this one up there, one of my... Favourite football boots, number one, Copa Mondiales that I used to wear, absolutely um, timeless classics. But also with your players, you know, I'm, I'm 45 now um, and I wouldn't go into a shop and ask for a size 45 boot. Same with our players, the ones that I coach that might be sizes, you know, they're, they're nine, but they might be sizes four and five and six. They're all completely different sizes. It's not a, a, a one shoe fits all thing. They're all completely different. So it's coming up with a philosophy that we can share with them that's going to stretch and challenge them, um, but it equally is uh, um, age-specific and it's appropriate for them. So, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm really conscious of time and, I'm, and I want to allow some time for some questions as well. So I suppose the um, key messages for me in all this is to be clear why your club exists, to engage with coaches, players, um, parents and volunteers so those key stakeholders that are going to be involved and promote behaviour that is consistent with your own and your club's philosophy as was mentioned at the start that you'll have a, um, a point of reference there
Okay, so a bit of a whistle stop talk through, but um, guys, if you've got any questions, my chat box has disappeared now. So any questions, I'll do my best to to answer them. So Mark, what I'll say to them, thank you very much. What I'll say is that they can raise their hand or put their question in the chat and Yale, Yale will monitor the chat and yeah, I would look for perfect. their hand raised. So, so Yale, help me just look at the chat, please. Is there any questions for Mark? And guys, let's, let's make use of the opportunity. Please. Lyndon. Yeah, yes, coach. Um, good afternoon. What Hi, I wanted to ask, um, part of our situation down here is we have a lot of academies. We got a lot of academies, but we have no tournaments to play in. So it's quite difficult for most coaches um, to have, how do you say, a set schedule for like after games and this and that, and you move on. Um, it's kind of like the kids show up for two or three, you know, times per week and you just work on whatever, and then they go away. And then if they do play, all their competitive games are played in small-sided games, or every now and again, you may play a pickup game against another academy. But there's no mm. real tournament. So um, is there any suggestions you have there um, that might be able to help? Um, so could, can you create your, your, your own tournaments? Do you do in-house stuff, Lyndon? Right. So, like I said, there, there, there's um, most academies don't have um, teams for each age group or whatever like that. You right. might have a group that range from five to, 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 to ten year olds, you know, yeah. and, and you have about 20 of them. You know, then you have some clubs that might have more, but there's only about four or five really organized academies in terms of um, attached to maybe some of the professional clubs and stuff. But there's not a whole lot. So there's yeah. not a lot of opportunities for the kids to be in tournaments or play every yeah. weekend, every weekend, if, if, yeah. if, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 no, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's a really good question, um, and, and, and it's a really good point. We're coming into the tournament season um, in, in, in England now, but I suppose for me it would be trying to maximise your time in, in training sessions, um, trying to create um, sort of match-like environments there, maybe um, really sort of refining what your philosophy is about as a, as a club, as an organisation, getting a group of you together and saying, you know, what, what are we about? What do we stand for? What do we want our players to get out of this? Um, so, so most in, in the UK, grassroots level would be fun and enjoyment, or that's what's said. Um, if it's winning, if, it, if winning is a priority at that age, that's okay. It wouldn't be a priority for me, but then what are you going to do? What have you put in place to, to try and implement that? But it's going to be difficult um, with limited games, I'm sure. So uh, um, MTS has asked in, in the chat, is it important to have a statement of philosophy? Is it important to have a statement of philosophy? Yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it's like the blueprint, if you like something that, sort of underpins what you are about but I, I i don't think it's a case of um waking up in the morning and just coming up with a strap line and saying right that's it this is this is us i think we're living in a time now where we need to be open and transparent and involve everyone all of the stakeholders where we can and say you know what 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 are we about let's look around the table what are we about what do we stand for let's all have a say in this um and I've had the experience myself with, with professional football managers that um, have not just limited it to the team. They've got the whole club involved. And I'm talking the marketing department, the, uh, the community department, the people that from the club shop, everyone on a big flip chart piece of paper. There was hundreds of us in a room and said, what are we about? Really refined it, took down some of the key points and we all had to sign it. Every single one of us, hundred of us had to sign it. These charts were then laminated and put around the club as a point of reference. But don't sign it if you are not comfortable with some of these things. So I think if you are going to make a statement, it's got to be something um, that's in unison and that you all agree to and you can all adhere to. Okay. And, and next question, next question, Mark, from Peter Peer. Where does the coach's philosophy and the club's philosophy meet? And when they differ, where does the compromise lay? Also for top managers, does the coach's philosophy reign? 
Yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a um, that's a bit of a tricky one, isn't it? It's um, I suppose it's it's you know the second from last slide about clear, effective, clear, concise communication, making sure that you're all on the same page. There's no point in me having a coaching philosophy that's different um, uh, from the from the playing philosophy. There's no point in having unrealistic unrealistic expectations you know it's got to be something that we can all um agree on around the table let's say if it's a if it's a board uh, what are we about do we all agree on this is it realistic is it achievable um and then it might be that same thing where you where you document that and you and you all sign it but um yeah i haven't experienced that too much but i'm guessing it um it, it will it will take place and also, just um, Roger Smith in the chat was asking regarding the 70, 70 um, percent of the ball rolling in the practice. Yeah. How important is this? I think it, I, um, when I was growing up, we didn't have any many Mavericks, right? So we had a player called Paul Gascoigne, I suppose, who was our Maverick, our one player. When I look at academy football now and the, and the team that I work for, even at under eights. I've got uh, players that are all comfortable with the ball. First and foremost, that they're, they're comfortable with the ball. And I look back now and I think when I was growing up, there was so much time wasted with the ball. There was no free expression for me. I, 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 the coach wanted me to get rid of the ball straight away. I couldn't express myself. I wasn't allowed to do any tricks or skills. I had to get rid of it straight away. There was too much time wasted in line drills, too much time spent by the coach talking and not enough interaction with the players. But most importantly, there wasn't enough contact with the football. So this thing that then I played with on a Saturday or a Sunday in a match situation was almost alien to me. I wasn't comfortable with this one thing that I should have been comfortable with. So that's a, a guideline for us, 70% ball rolling. And that means certainly at under 11s, you know, if, if, if you coaches on the call or anything like me, when you were young, the first thing you would have asked your coaches, are we playing matches today? And that's probably the first thing your players will ask you, are we playing matches? Under 11s, for me, I say we're playing matches right now at the start. And it throws them a little bit because they expect the game's going to be at the end. We're playing matches right now. Right now. 1v1s, 2v1s, 3v2s, 4v3s, whatever it is. Even better for me that it's outnumbered. It's a 5v4 because it happens in the game. You'll see when you watch the Champions League, there'll be both teams will try and exploit overloads. 2v1s in wide areas, 3v2s in central areas. That's what they're trying to do. So the more we can practice that in the games is better. Um, and lastly on that, there was a, a manager, some of you guys remember on the call, called Jean Tigana, who was a French international that managed uh, Fulham in the UK some years ago. But but he's, he, he was very forward thinking. And that was his thing, that in one hour session, that the player should have a thousand touches of the ball in one hour. So that was as soon as they arrived, here you go, here's a football. It wasn't, there's a big bag of 20 footballs here, but you can't touch them until we're 25 minutes into the session. No, here it is. Practice your kick-ups, practice your skills, practice your tricks, practice um, playing that ball against a, a, a backboard and receiving it on your front foot. Practice hitting it against the wall and receiving it on your safe side. All of these things. Touches with both parts of your feet, different parts of your feet. Um... And I think that's the difference now in this country. We're seeing the fruits of it where we've got, and again, you'll see tonight for, for Manchester City is a, someone like John Stones, who in my era, if he came through, he would have been told to head it and kick it. That's it. Head it, kick it, get rid of it. Now you'll see him be comfortable on the ball and able to come out um, through through the defensive third into the middle third of the pitch. Sorry, long-winded answer, but it's something that I'm really, really passionate about. Okay, Jason Bourne. Jason Bourne, you had your hand raised. Can you, can you unmute and ask your question, please, Jason Bourne? Yes, good day, everybody. Um, hi, Jason. Hi, my, my question is in relation to the difference between um, applying a philosophy in an academy scenario versus applying a, 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 a philosophy in an area where you have individual clientele. So for example, um, I am part of an academy, which of course has a philosophy in which I apply, but then I also have other clients on an individual basis. So I may have like seven additional groups for, oh, during the course of the week with sometimes like two, two, two youngsters or three youngsters or four or five youngsters. And the thing is, um, my philosophy is, is 
very heavily based on technical ability, right? And I think it's important to instill that from a very early age. Um, my, my, child, my question is, do you now, based on having different age groups within my group, not in the, in the academy environment, how do you apply or when do you apply the philosophy? Because of course, every group will be different. Can you still have a foundation of, of technical ability being your philosophy or should you, you know, separate it a little bit and some groups you may decide to have fun until they show the readiness for, to, to, uh, for the application of a, of a philosophy or should you just find a way to incorporate it from the very beginning with every group that you have? Oh, what a fantastic question, Jason. What a brilliant question. Um, I've just jot, jotted down a couple of things from that. Um, so I think what would probably underpin that for me would be my key values. And then my key values would be the, those that are non-negotiables for me. Um, so that would I would carry those key values and I would be whether I'm coaching in the one-to-one -one sessions or I'm coaching a team so, so, so they would still apply. Um, I think um, then going into a group setting, I think I would have um, an outline of a philosophy. I think I alluded to it at the start, which would then have different layers in depending on the age groups that I was working with. So for example, when I was working with the under fives, I know my overall philosophy is to make the pitch really, really big. I wanted to, I want to play expansive football, but also when out of possession, I want to make the pitch narrow and make it difficult for them to get through. That was it for under fives. That would have stayed with me probably um, um, when I'm working with under 11s and 12s and 13s, but then I would add to that. So in that, then I'd add the detail of where I want them to go and press and hunt the ball back. Um, how they were going to do that, what triggers I would use in terms of the square pass or a poor first touch, um, then I would add that sort of layer of detail in there. Um, but equally, equally, um, Jason, you know, I've come out of sort of one philosophy, if you like, from the Football Association, going into something completely new with 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 Arsenal. I think that's the art of being a coach as well, where you can um, adapt you know, all of the time and you can, and you can say, right, that's one thing. Okay. But now I'm moving into this in amongst all of that, your key values, you know, remain as that sort of golden thread, if you like, and they're the non-negotiables, but what a great question, Jason. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And Omari, Omari, can you unmute and ask your question, please? Omari, Omari Billy. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, Omari. No, I just wanted to get your perspective on, uh, well, a lot of the academies down here, we, our numbers sometimes, when you look around, the numbers are very big. But I wanted to focus now and get your perspective on the importance of the number of players to coach, where we could develop, because we spend a lot of time looking for the player who is ready to make the team, and a lot of the times forget about the development process. And this is from a very young age. We're looking for that player who already have it by the age of 10. But what about those who are still who still need the assistance? Can we find that player with among 15 that we have in front of us right now? Or is it best that, let's say we have eight to one coach who could spend time developing that player, the individual development that that player may need in order to maximize his potential. Because a lot of times that same player we chose for the under 12s, when it comes to the under 80, under 20, they are no longer around. They are no longer around. The players that took the time and went through the developmental process now is the player who is ready to go to the next level. Mm. So it's just the importance. I know a lot of times we discard a lot of players at a young age because of what we were looking for, the finished product at age 10, 11, you know? And that's just my thoughts. I don't know what your perspective is on that. Amari, again, what a fantastic question. A really, really good question. Um, this is, this, this is, these are my thoughts, right? So in grassroots football, we use something called stri striving to keep up, coping and forging ahead. Those three areas. Striving to keep up, coping and forging ahead 
and in a in a, in a grassroots setting and, and when i say grassroots sort of like a, a general sort of fun football club football session you want to have all of those three in there you'll have the ones that are forging ahead the ones that are pushing for those academies you're going to have the ones that are coping in the middle that probably aren't the standout players, but they're, they're, they're not the sort of novice players. And then you're going to have the ones that are striving to keep up, as we call it, the ones that are, I'm coming to this session because my friend's coming. So then I think it's the art of the coach to be able to say, what challenges am I going to put in place for these individuals? And again, it's easier said than done, and it needs to be planned out over a period of time. So I know let's say that Dion struggles with his uh, left foot a little bit or he, he struggles with his first touch. As my session's evolving, I can go around and, and uh, work on, we call it individual interventions or drive-bys, right? So I haven't got to stop the practice, but I can give Dion a different challenge that I might do to, uh, to you, Omari, or to, to Clint or, or Alexandria, or whoever was on the call. They, because it relates back to those first couple of slides that I did at the start about the tomato ketchup. We're all completely different. So it would be remiss for me to go, right, and I've seen it happen in France when I worked in France for a little bit, of coaches that have their whistle in their mouth and they do everything to time. So we say, right, we're going to go two touch for two minutes, go, bang. Two touch, two touch, two touch. And I, as a coach, walk up and down the line, then I blow my whistle. Now we're going to go one touch. The problem is, Dion and myself can do it one touch, but there might be a couple of others that couldn't even do two touch. So how's that coaching and how's that me developing them when I've moved it on at that rate? So we're all completely different and we need, we need something different. Um, and then um, it's a difficult one as well, isn't it? Because uh, uh, is it about the end product? Or are we looking at potential? Certainly with the, the young ones that we get in under eights, they're not going to be the finished article. They're still, they're still babies. You know, they're still in bed with teddy bears and uh, playing with toy when they come on the pitch. They're playing above their years, granted. But we don't know what we're, we're signing at that age. A lot of it is potential. But great question. Alexandra, can you please unmute and ask your question, please, Alexandra? Hi, Dion. Thanks. Um, actually, Mark, I hope you don't mind. It's not so much a question as sort of a, a statement to provoke. Yeah, no, great. Um, uh, just a, um, a sneaky sort of fact. I'm a sports psychologist, so it's been really interesting to sit in the really? call and listen to um, someone as experienced as yourself talking about developing coaching philosophies because of course I sit with coaches and do this um, quite often and it's, yeah. it's, it's nice to hear it from a technical coaching aspect sort of thing um, and I think speaking to the culture of sport in Trinidad I think it's important um, because I heard a lot about technical philosophies and you know people are asking a lot of questions about what should my philosophy be for specific age groups but I think as yeah. well in developing a coaching philosophy, um, you know, it should underlie like, why am I coaching effectively? Why, why am I trying to impart knowledge onto, and who am I coaching? Um, you know, am I specializing too early? Because quite often we can have many coaches who expect six year olds, eight year olds to, you know, have great ball handling skills or defensive skills, uh, you know, have the technical skills of the first touch and so on. And we lose the instance of the value of play. And in sports psychology, we try to kind of instill in that, that the value of play in itself teaches skill. Just because you're not doing a, a specific quote unquote drill or, or, you know, repeated practice, it doesn't mean that the athlete isn't learning um, some sort of, of technical skill. And then I think an important question when developing a coaching philosophy is, um, how do I define success as a coach in each of my players? Does it mean that every time we go play a practice match, we win? That's when we are successful as a team, as a club, as individuals. Or is success defined by, well, yes, two weeks ago, I couldn't do this. And, and today I've gotten a bit better at it. Is progress success as well? And do we practice behaviors that supports that? Because quite mm. often, as Omari uh, rightfully said, and it, I was kind of chatting with Dion a little bit as well, that 
we don't necessarily develop the environment of excellence. We develop that environment of win and lose, and we lose players, um, great potential players as a result of that, because we don't take the time to develop them holistically, but instead focus solely on the technical philosophy. So just some thoughts but that were provoked, of course, by all wonderful presentations. So. Amen, amen, Alexandria. <laughs> What a lovely statement, absolutely fantastic. And, and you know, um, I wish people like you were around when, when I was coming through and, and, and that sort of seven-year-old that needed some help and support and guidance um, in all of these areas. And that's why I love the FA's four-corner model. It's as simple as four corners, technical, psychological, physical, and social. And the importance of play, as you rightly said, then is 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 huge. It really is. It's so so important. Um, and how do we define success exactly? You know, it's, yeah. for us, it, it it's not about winning and losing. We don't even ask the scores. Yeah. Um, we, it's got to be fun based. The, the re, uh, realistically, um, less than one percent of these kids are going to go on and make professional footballers. So we've got to be there to make their journey fun and enjoyable along the way. That's what it is. It's not about us. I'm sorry, coaches. Um, we've had our go at playing and we're not good enough. That's why, we're, that's why we're on this call. I'm sorry to break the news. For those who can't so do sorry. teach. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so it's about them now. It is. It really is. It's, it, it's about them. Um, and I see it. I see it when I go around these um, clubs and I watch the coaches and, you know, there's lots of this sort of microaggression of, um, and all of this sort of jargonistic behaviour and all of these terms that are out now um, in the game, you know, pressing and um, counter press and this, that and the other, almost to exclude people from conversations. Break it down. Keep it simple. Keep it simple, yeah. You know, 100%. these things are just uh, essential, but yeah, it's got to be, it's got to be fun and enjoyable. Um all of the time, yeah. You know, and I think um, uh, when I first met Dion, I shared the story of uh, a friend of mine that coached in, in, in the US and he was coaching with a, a group, a camp, and they got to the end of the course and there was hundreds of these kids there and uh, the coach was giving out some awards after and he went into this uh, amazing speech to these under nines um, and he was saying, you know, this is what they, we did and technically this is what we worked on and this was great and we played against these and we won, da, da, da. And it, it, this speech went on for about 10, 15 minutes and he said, has anyone got any questions? And one of the, the nine-year-olds that played with him uh, throughout the week said, coach, have you got a dog? <laughs> <laughs> and he kind of went, that's where their minds were at. Oh, that's where they were at. The scores are out the window. It doesn't matter about those scores. Did they have fun? This, this one nine-year-old was more interested if the coach had a dog. Um, so, yeah, we've got to check ourselves sometimes. But what a great statement, Alexandra. Thank you so much. And, uh, oh, thank you very much. Guys, um, before we go on to the others, we, we, we have a, um, a podcast as well that I run and, and we talk about things like this that you've mentioned. It's called The Grassroots Football Coach. Uh, the Grassroots Football Coach podcast. So please feel free to have a listen on there. There's lots of current professional managers. There's grassroots managers. There's um, a, a women's international player, England international player who talks on there, but sharing all of their wonderful experiences as well as, as, as players and coaches. So um, please feel free to check that out also. Mark, Mark, I shared with some of the coaches already the, the podcast, but can you, when you get a little time, can you just put the podcast in the, in the chat? And the next yeah. question comes from, um, he's been waiting quite patiently, Calm, calm the, um, the Freitas. Calm, can you, can you unmute and ask your question, please? You had a, a wonderful person in the chat. Calm the Freitas. Can you ask your question, please? Yes, yeah, so afternoon. Uh, I was just asking in terms of club philosophies, what is the alignment between the FA, I guess he, since you've been on both sides, um, since you have quite established clubs, I, I imagine they would have their own philosophies. And in terms of when the Three Lions hat now and you guys producing English players, is there any alignment at all or is it just left to the individual clubs? I mean, I ah, do their own philosophy. Question. And then how do you align it for, for England's benefit? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. 
Um, no, so so the national team um, will have their philosophy, their playing philosophy, um, and coaching philosophy. And I was a part of the sort of coaching philosophy side. So those 12 hexagons that I showed you, they're very much on the coaching side and the 70% ball rolling and um, developing the carousel, all of that kind of thing. And I suppose um, as a national team, we would have loved um, all the professional teams underneath that to kind of adhere to that same philosophy. But it, the, the fact of the matter is it's, you know, they, they were sort of, um, they're independent to themselves, so they didn't have to adhere to that, and most have got their own philosophy. So, for example, we played Brighton today. Arsenal's philosophy will be totally different to to Brighton's. I think, by and large, most most clubs will probably fall in line to the FA's sort of four corner stuff, and um, you know, playing out from the back and playing through the thirds of the pitch and defending intelligently and pressing high. That's kind of a common theme at the minute. But um, clubs are fairly sort of uh, um, independent in respects of, um, of of their own philosophy. Yeah, but what a great question! Um, oh, yeah. sorry, just sorry, just to fi to finish that, we have um, you can check it out. It'll be online somewhere. But the England DNA. So what sort of um, goes on from that question is, you know, for years the England team there was no identity, there was no real way of playing. Um, so it was sort of the inception of the, the England DNA. I think it was about 2011 with uh, Sir Trevor Brookin and a couple of others that sort of said, what are we about as a nation? Because we keep doing recce's and going over to um, Spain to see what they're doing, Germany and France and Belgium and Italy. But what about us? What are we about? Um, so that was, was, was the England DNA was born out of that. So... Um, which, which lends itself to this talk that I've just done, you know, is it, what, what are we about? What do we stand for? Um, and then out of that came the sort of playing and coaching philosophy. So sure, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Clint Crouch, Clint Crouch from Canada. Clint, can you ask a question, please? Uh, thank you, um, technical director Dion. Thank you, coach River for taking my question. Uh, my question stems from um, personal experience. Just to give a little bit of a background, so I was playing club football when I was a youth. And from there, I was selected for the regional or provincial team. When I went to the regional provincial team, the first few training se sessions, I was basically thrown to the lion's den. It was brand new to me. Um, the coach actually had to pull me in aside and say, you're a talented player, just relax and, and play your game. So my question is, most times, we have a philosophy based on our personal what we want what we want to have as our own from our own club perspective and our own success how do we prepare our players in an unselfish way psychologically to play um for potential for other coaches and other clubs if they may go on to play for another club or to play for another academy or to go on to play professionally or to play for a university um again like myself i was caught off guard came from one coaching philosophy of a club i was thrown to another environment where it was just professional different standard higher standard and so i had to get adjusted very fast so how can we prepare our players to play in a different environment as they go on and as they grow up into a different age group or, or, or a different environment? Oh, again, what, what, a, what a brilliant question. Um, I talked about this just yesterday, actually, with, with a group of players that we had because the question came out. We were very fortunate because we played on the, the, the Emirates Stadium, the home of Arsenal, um, on uh, Thursday. And we noticed a little bit of a difference, actually, because most of our players play on 3G. Um, which was probably uh, a bit quicker, actually, than, than the grass that we played on. Not, not many of our academy players play on grass, but this was a, a sort of dry grass pitch. Um, and we just saw a different side to one or two of them. And I asked the question as well, similar to what you said, you know, what, what do you think about this? And they said, you know, what, 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 a, great, what a great idea at a young age 
to be able to, you know, play on a 3G pitch, play on grass. There was one club that asked them to sort of play. They thought they were going to play on a 3G pitch, but they played out the back on this, almost like a, a bit of a cow field, let's say, um, where the grass was long. And it just challenged them. Um, it challenged them in different ways. So I suppose in terms of what we're trying to do as, as, as coaches and practitioners is um, develop them. I suppose it's probably sort of quite good development, really. Um, what we also do is certainly with our, let's say our under eights is we play them up against some under nines. So some under nines academy, so they get used to perhaps a different challenge in terms of physicality, um, which they're probably not used to because we're very, very technical, very good on the ball. But then that physical challenge gets in the way and, and, and the realisation that um, we're not having it our own way. So then how are players reacting? And let's be mindful, they're, you know, they're still very young. We're, they're babies. They, we, we know that. But just getting them used to, to things um, nice and early, different formations. One week it be five aside, next week it be six aside. Different pitches. Um, sometimes they play with a goalkeeper, sometimes without. So all of these things gradually, I suppose, in, in the process, rather than it being sprung on you, I think is um, sometimes beneficial. But great question. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Damien, Daniel. Damien, can you, can you unmute and ask your question, please? Damien, are you there? Are you still there, Damien? Hello? Yes, Damien, you can go, you can go ahead and ask your question, sir. Yes, so, so the question for, for Mark trying to tie in what Alexandra was saying. Um, you mentioned during the coaching sessions, stepping back and looking at the session to see what went wrong. Um, in terms of the philosophy, what measures do you have in place to make sure that you are staying on the philosophy? And how often do you do an evaluation to make sure that you are actually doing what you are saying? Yeah, really good, really good question. Um, so <clears throat> that those periods of silence for us are, are, are essential because it can be sort of crash bang wallop sometimes. And as I said, you're sort of in the, in the middle of it all. So encouraging coaches to take a deep breath and come out and stand out and have a look. But also um, being true to yourself, um, kind of getting rid of your ego, um, you know, we say to our coaches, you, you, you're here because you can coach. We know that you can coach, but it's it's not about you now. It's about these players. So step back, decide, identify what they need in terms of their development, but also look inside your own tracksuit as well. You know, if it's not quite worked out on the pitch, you know, my coach used to point the finger at us all the time. And looking back now, I'm thinking it wasn't always us, you know, I spent 20 minutes trying to figure out as a 15 year old what my coach wanted from me because he spoke at me for 20 minutes or to us as a group when it was pouring down with rain on a cold Tuesday night in England. Uh, so I had to then, I wouldn't have put my hand up in that environment. Why? Because we were 15 and my friends would have probably laughed at me for not understanding it. So I would sneak to the back of the group and try and work out what they were doing to come back in again. And I'm thinking, that wasn't right. That wasn't right. He needed to be able to talk to us and show us in different ways, not just in an auditory sense, but catering for us as kinesthetic learners, as visual learners, as readers, bringing whiteboards or visual aids out with him as well, which would have made his life so much easier. Um, it was a different era, a totally different era. But I think if he was now to be true to himself, he would have wished that he, 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 he did all those things. So I think it's that really... Um, identifying what your key values are and really living them, not just rushing and writing three things down or, um, you know, some that I've seen, they've got these fancy word on the, on the mug, a drinking when they're drinking their tea and coffees out, but they're not living those things. You know, um, I think that's a, that would be a great start. Uh, we just do one or two more questions. And then we had um, Gerard in the chat. He was asking about, the facilities, you know, because we say sometimes we don't have the right facilities, but how important yeah. it is for the facilities. That's a question that Jared had in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, it's something that we've struggled with over here for years. So I grew up playing on those sort of cow fields and, um, you know, the risk of injuries was really, really high. Um, a lot of games were called off due to poor conditions of the pitch and poor weather, no training facilities. So we've, we've certainly here, we've gone along the route now of um, lots of these sort of five-a-side centres where... Um, where the, the games have kind of never called off really because it's on 3G. The influx of funding and 3G pitches that have gone up all over the country. Um, because what we found, certainly with, with the Football Association, was there's a huge dropout rate, certainly in boys' football from about 14 onwards. So boys were dropping out and not playing, probably because of what I've just said, actually. The games um, were called off. It was, it was, the facilities were poor. So it was a huge dropout rate. Um, so we've had to sort of look at that and, and, and rectify that over, over recent years, really. But that's been the main thing for us. Is the environment conducive for learning to take place? Is it safe? Um, you know, and can we maximise our time in these places? You know, some of the facilities were just really poor and unsafe and um, it's no good. It's no matter how good your, your, your playing and coaching philosophy was, you didn't have a chance to impart it because you just couldn't play and I know, Mark, you, you thank you very much. I know you, you touched on this before, but for us here in the Caribbean, and this is not just a Trinidad thing, this is more for the Caribbean, we all want to be outstanding in, as, as coaches, and we go to an environment to, to, together, but as you talked about, we all signing on, saying that we, we agree to this, but everybody here wants to be the top coach. So in terms of what advice can you give to us as a nation, as a, a Caribbean, and by extension, um, North America, to... To, to don't see ourselves as the stars, but but can we contribute to, to, to the overall program? Because it's an issue that we have here as coaches. Yeah. I, I, I think the first step is things like this, Dion. And I have to say, um, knowing you for this very short time I had, that you, your, your enthusiasm um, for coach development is, is frightening. It's absolutely fantastic. And, um, you know, I think the... the the organisation is lucky to have you there, not to embarrass you too much, but I know that we share a similar mindset in terms of this sort of coach development and education. And I think the minute, the minute as coaches and as practitioners, we say, right, I don't need to come on these calls. I don't need to go on these CPD events. I don't need to attend this event. I think there's a problem. You know, the more that we can come on stuff like this, the more we can make ourselves uh, vulnerable, if you like, that's where learning is going to take place. I've learned lots here, just listening to one or two people on the call. Um, on the podcast, we in, we interview someone called Russell Martin, who's the manager of uh, MK Dons in the uh, 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 League One, who actually came to the call with a pad and paper. Yeah, yeah. we're interviewing him. And I said, why have you got that? Because I'm always making notes. I'm always trying to learn something new. Might learn something new from this call. And I thought, wow. My estimation of this guy has gone right to the top. And if you look, actually, in terms of a philosophy, a playing philosophy, you guys can check this out. I don't know um, if it's up to date now. But in terms of um, uh, possession stats, his team were, were up there. I don't, not just in Europe, I think in world football, in, in terms of keeping possession. That's how dedicated and uh, um, he was to that task. So um, he's someone I know that's forever on courses, forever on CPD events. And of course, you're not going to agree with everything. There's going to be people on this call. Of course, there is that at the end that say, well, I didn't take much from that. There's going to be one or two that go, well, I've learned this and I've learned that. This is, this is where learning takes place on all of these things. You know, it's a very small, small community, but I had a conversation with one of our... Uh, uh, managers today at uh, Arsenal, one of the junior teams. And we agreed that, again, if you look at the four corners that I keep mentioning, that technical, psychological, um, social and physical, the technical really is kind of a small part. When you think about an, a holistic approach to coaching, for me, it's a, a small part of the pie. If you can get the other stuff right, you know, the stuff that Alexandria was saying about that psychological side is huge. It is massive. There's someone that I'm um, researching at the minute called Dr. Uh, Stephen Porges um, about the social engagement system. You know, and our social engagement systems are completely different at different ages. You know, basically it's uh, um, fight and flight and freeze. 
and the feeling that our, our body does to us, that sort of gut feeling, if you like. So if you could imagine being um, in, in, a, in a, if this was in a classroom, let's say, um, and I said, and I pointed the finger and I said, right, one of you's got to come out and do a, a five minute presentation in front of everyone. Well, some people will relish that and think this is brilliant. Other people would not be in their social engagement system and then they would be in, uh, in fear and then fight and fright would kick in or freeze or even shut down where they would say, no, this is not for me. So learning wouldn't take place in that environment for that individual. So it's all of this stuff that we need to take on because there's so many more facets out there. And if you want to be that top coach, these are the things that you've got to take on because the coaches in this country are realizing that now, you know, and, and, and there's coaches when I was doing my coaching qualifications that were very, very good technical coaches, very good technical coaches that could come out with um, all of these points that would just fry my brain, but perhaps didn't know how to talk to people perhaps didn't know how to connect with people, that connection versus correction bit at the start, perhaps didn't know about individuals, their preferred learning styles. There's coaches that wouldn't even know what teams their players supported um, or what their home situation was or anything like that because the connection part hasn't taken place. So if you're thinking about this holistic approach and creating a real positive learning environment, when you look at that, the technical bit's a small bit. It really is. So, it's educating yourself in other areas. If, you, if you're looking to educate yourself up the, the sort of mainstream sort of FIFA, UEFA coaching ladders, that's great. But that's one thing. Our coaches now are going on uh, psychology courses, um, mental health courses, which is essential. One in three of us, one in four of us struggle with poor mental health. You know, so when we're watching a player and they're not, they're not quite doing what we've asked, is it me raining down on them and pointing the finger? Or do I know that actually they're experiencing something else that I need to be aware of as that coach? So no longer is it just us as coaches now. Under that umbrella, we're, we're, we're coaches, we're therapists, we're psychologists, we're everything for that hour. And we don't get paid enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Mark, and I know, we, I know we, we could go on and on. So what I'm going to do is, Mark, thank you very much. What I'm going to do, is I'm going to ask a few individuals to just give a very quick synopsis and, a, and to move a little vote of time. So I'm going to call on a few individuals. So I'm calling on John Michael Williams, one of our former national goalkeepers, to say a few words, please, John. Hi, good afternoon, guys. Good afternoon. Hi. Oh, I was just trying to figure out how to unmute this mic here. I'm not too good with this technology. No worries. Um, yeah, today was very informative. I, I really, I don't want to use the word impressed because I know having an affiliation with a club like Arsenal, you have to have a, 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 a high level of, of, of football intelligence. And, and, and just the way you speak and you articulate yourself was really good today. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I think that... There were so many good points. Um, we have to try as coaches to understand that, as you said before, it's no longer about the coaches anymore. Mm. When you become a coach, it's not about you. It's about mm. developing mm. players. Mm. That's all it's about. It's about the younger ones. You know, and I think sometimes culturally we lose sight of of that, we try to be the star, try to be the star of the show to make sure we get the plaudits and so on and so forth. And, and we lose sight of really developing players. And again, it's, it's, it, it is important. Another thing we do culturally that we, we have to try to change is we have to learn our players. We have to learn um, how they learn, you know? 100%. Not everybody could 100%. develop from, from screaming and shouting. And, and even more so now this generation, this younger generation that we're interacting with now, less and less and less of them kind of interact or, 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 or improve and gain knowledge from that, that old time where we had where you scream and you shout and you try to kind of berate the players into understanding. Now we really have to find time in figuring out how they learn how to get the best out of them and um, utilize it. And every individual is different. And um, the last thing is, uh, I think is important. I think um, 
Alexandria touched on it, and it is so important now, especially with this global pandemic, this global health situation, this um, mental health situation. Um, especially young males, culturally, again, in Trinidad and Tobago, were thought, uh, were taught, sorry, to bottle up their emotions and, and to be a man. You know, to be a man, you have to be macho. You can't express much, much emotion, that kind of stuff. And me, I have a 10 year older daughter. And like I say to my friends, I have a godson who's around eight or nine. Like, it doesn't matter if you're a, a male or a female. Everybody on the planet goes through every single emotion, whether it be fear, anxiety, depression, joy, sorrow, and so on. So we have to really try to, 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 prepare and, and to, to, to try to develop the minds of the young people that, that we have in front of us. Because sometimes certain behaviors and patterns that were not attended to when they were younger, they come into a, 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 a senior, into adulthood with those same behaviors and patterns and they still have to be addressed, you know? So, I mean, thanks for today. I really enjoyed listening to everything that, that was said. Yeah. Everybody has different point of views. Um, you know, from coaching philosophies to 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 to, to, to playing philosophies, and and again, it's not it's important not to to mix both, um, but to understand both. And um, again, thank you for just 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 imparting this knowledge. Thanks to all the people who were here today, yeah. who took time out of their busy day. I know everybody's excited about the final coming up. Um, you being an Arsenal man, I know you don't want Chelsea to win. At all. <laughs> 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 keep it, keep, keep it, keep it good, keep it good. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it was really, really, really insightful, and and and, and we could all learn it. Eh? There's there's nothing that says that you, you you reach a certain age or you reach a certain level and you 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 have to stop learning or you do stop learning. Um, I seen one question I wanted to ask so bad, and and I didn't know you were involved with certain levels of the FA in England. I've seen a report yeah. come up lately where they said Klopp has to do over his, his coaching license or something like that. Where what? Sorry, Jan? Jürgen Klopp. He has yeah. to redo some form of his license or certification or something like that, or was that? Um, I don't know. So um, I suppose, yeah, to manage in the Premier League, you'd need your uh, pro license. Um, yeah, but I think he did it before, and he has to do some some sort of refresher or something. And to me, it was it was it, it destroyed my mind, but it had me <laughs> thinking as well, you know. Yeah. Because yeah, I again, know. again, I, I I saw a quote the other day that said, "You have to learn, and then you have to unlearn, and then you have to relearn to do the same yeah. things." You know, because of evolution, of course, with everything. You have to relearn to do certain things. And, and I think yeah. that is, is so important. I mean, I wouldn't be the one to have to tell Klopp who's, who's just won a, a Champions League in a Premier League. <laughs> I know. <laughs> he has yeah. to go and do certain licenses and stuff over again. But <clears throat> now in 2021, you know, different techniques, different technologies, different philosophies and so on. And it's just, just a matter of just to keep progressing and evolving and to stay relevant. You have to keep learning stuff, you know? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you very much, Jan. Sorry. So, yeah, right. thanks again for, for today. And, and, and again, to all the people on the call, thank you for taking the time out. Yeah. Um, just, just, just keep learning. Just keep, keep an open mind and keep learning, you know? Jan, can I, can I just ask before you go, what, what's your involvement? Who are you coaching and what level? Um, I actually I played for Trinidad and Tobago for 14, 15 years. Um, <laughs> and I... I'm right. now coaching in, a goalkeeper coach in the Canadian Professional League. We're meant to start sometime next month. Um, I've been coaching here for the last couple of years, last, last year being my last year as a player, player coach. And now I'm just into the goalkeeping coaching side of it. I just actually right. started doing my B license. So a lot of what Ale Alexandria was talking about is just coming up, coming and going through those terms. So, um, yeah, just informative. Thanks, Alexandra. I have a paper to write soon, so thanks for so many words. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. My, no, my, my, my point is that, you know, I've learned, I've learned something on this call today, and um, the biggest compliment I can, I can pay to you, Jan, what you said is I, I, I would love to play for you. All the stuff that you're talking about, um, how your mind's working, how you probably evolved, and I think, um, you know, if, if the 
call to end now, I think, well, we, we, we've had a great time. I've hopefully imparted something and Dion's works and wonders, but, you know, what a great, uh, insightful um, um, call. So that's brilliant, Jan. Thank you very much. And I wish you the, uh, the very best. And I think that's a really good point because people say that, you know, they've had 25 years or 30 years experience as a coach, but is that 25 years or 30 years doing the same thing? Yeah. Or is that 25, 30 years having different experiences because they're totally different they are totally different and when you can open your mind like Jan was talking about and be be open and he's totally right by the way in terms of mental health and boys and this horrible man up culture that we find ourselves in um and getting getting them to to voice any concerns they've got and just to open up and talk is massive it's huge all of these things are put into this sort of pie if you like of us being uh, coaches and educators and it's it's huge so um what what a, what a brilliant call thank you thank you and thank you and and what i'll do i'll ask mrs um before i ask mrs not to help us wrap up um let me just say to you guys and we talk about the mental side tomorrow from 2 to three thirty, we have the ttfa is starting uh there is hope uh series for players between the ages of 10 and 19 and we have um, a speaker in Mr. Don Lafourcade, who, who is a motivational speaker. That's my twin. But he's doing it. They call tomorrow, and this is going to run for every every Sunday from that time, from two to three thirty. So you guys want to get interested? Just send myself or Yale an email, and we're going to give you guys the link for the kids to register for the parents to register the kids. So I'm going to ask Mrs. Not to say a few words, please, Mrs. Not. Um, th thank you, Dion, and I have to say I'm so privileged every week to be able to come on to the TTFA and be able to, to make a little summary. Um, for those of you who haven't been on from the beginning, um, we've always talked about, I've said about learning two or three things on in each session, and the ones that really um, stuck out for me today, Mark, was that your key values are non-negotiable. I, yeah. I really think that is so important. Um, people have to understand their key values. So that means a little reflection. Um, it's not something I could say and say, oh, jump in and say integrity as one of yours. It's always been one of mine. And that they, the key values are, are non-negotiable. I mean, there's there's so much and on, on the technical side. I love the big when you've got it. <laughs> and yeah. when you don't and then you just build on that so yeah. two two your two philosophies right there your coaching philosophy and then your playing philosophy mm -hmm. and there's something i've always challenged this this group every week is how can the trinidad and tobago football association what is the dna for trinidad and tobago football and, mm. and i think that that's the kind of question that you all have to keep talking and chatting about. I think it's important that there's a, a playing philosophy for, for Trinidad and Tobago. And as your chairman said at the beginning, and it's very much the theme that Dion has put out here, is everybody in? And I, I, I think so, just by each week, a hundred coaches coming on, you're in, but we want you to be really in. So on that note, for all the Chelsea fans, Good luck. <laughs> uh, my new fans, well, I guess, yeah, you have an advantage, but I'm a little bit <laughs> fan, so I'm neutral today. So goodbye, everybody. And I beg you, I beg you, please keep safe. Trinidad and Tobago is going through some rough times. Oh, we've got a state of emergency. We're, we're into a real lockdown now. So yeah. I'm just asking everybody to stay safe. Okay. And Mark, thank you so much. We're so privileged to have you, so much. you important people on, on, on a call with us. So as I said, I feel privileged as a member of the Olympic Committee to be on this call as well. So, so thank you, Mrs. everybody Knott. and thank you. Thanks again, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Knott. Same to you, Miss. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, hey, everybody. Thanks. Thank you for coming. And, and we're so fortunate to have Mark. And, and, and I'm sure we, we could discuss you know, trying to get him back on again at some point in time. Yes. Mark, thank you from, from everybody in Trans Tobago, the Caribbean, and those who are looking from abroad. We want to thank you very much. It's very, been very uh, informative. Um, uh, we're just going to leave the, the Zoom on for... Uh, Mark, can you put, please put in the podcast, information for the podcast? Yeah, put it in.
Hello, welcome in. Okay, great. Yeah, so that's awesome. So because we, we would love to listen and, and get some information there. So everybody, wel welcome and, 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 and welcome. thank you for coming. And we'll see you guys next week. Next week, we have a very interesting seminar again on next week. So you guys keep keep coming. Everybody's in. Have a wonderful afternoon. Enjoy yes, the game. Sir, same day, sir. And get your youngsters mm -hmm. on tomorrow. Get all your youngsters on tomorrow. You need that mental health and motivation. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, bye. bye. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. 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 I don't think you don't understand. I think you Bye. 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 <laughs>